So without further ado, it's a pleasure to have Henriette Elvang now telling us about generalizing the double, co double copy via the KLT bootstrap. Please go ahead. Thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak. This talk is about a new framework uh, for thinking about the double copy that allows us to generalize it via a procedure that we call the KLT bootstrap. So this is based on a recent paper with postdoc Juan Heng Chi, my grad student Aidan Herdeske, Callum Jones, who was my former student, who's now at UCLA, and Sudi Paranjapi, who defended her thesis this spring and is going to UC Davis. And there's be a, a little mention of work to appear with a new student, Alan Chen, at the end. So the KLT form of the double copy states that you take the gauge invariant color ordered uh, single trace amplitudes at tree level from some left sector theories, which could be Yang Mills, and a right sector theory, also Yang Mills, so it could be another one. And you multiply them together using a certain uh, rule, namely the KLT kernel. This is a function of model sums. And it's not just a product of amplitudes in general, it's a sum over a choice of n minus three factorial color orderings uh, indicated by these A's and B's in the sum here. And it's well known when you use this formula that Yang Mills times Yang Mills gives us gravity plus the antisymmetric tensor uh, two form and uh, as well as the dilaton. That's what I mean by gravity plus. So that's just one of example and we'll see other ones. To make this explicit at four point, I pick just color orderings for A there's a because we just need one n minus three factorial is one for n equals four. So I picked that to be the canonical one, two, three, four indicated in blue. And in orange, I picked the B to be one, two, four, three. So this is just one example of how the double copy works. And this component of the KLT kernel is simple, simply minus the Mandelstam variable S. So this is a very familiar form of the field theory KLT formula. It's really remarkable that this formula works. Uh, not just because the gravity Feynman rules are very complicated, while the Yang Mills ones are very simple, it's very non trivial that, that reduces, but even thinking about how this simple four point formula should even get the pole structure of the gravity amplitude right. That's something we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about generalizing this product. So let me highlight exactly what I mean by this being so non trivial. Let me take about the Yang Mills amplitudes that I took here. The one, two, three, four ordering has poles in the S and the U channel, simple poles, but never a pole in the T channel because it's not compatible with the color ordering. But the one, two, four, three has poles in S and T channels, but not in the U channel. The question is then, when the gravity amplitude, which has no color structure, must have simple poles in the S, T, and U channels, how can it possibly be that when I multiply these three level Young Mills amplitudes together, that I can even produce the correct pole structure and avoid things like double poles? The answer to this is, of course, that the double copy kernel takes care of this. So in the example where I multiply the one, two, three, four structure with the one, two, four, three structure, and the Mandelstam variable S sits in front of this from the kernel, then we see that in this product, I would have doubled the S pole, but the kernel takes care of canceling that. And then the product has simple poles in U and C from this product. Another form of the double copy would be to take the first line amplitude, the one with color ordering one, two, three, four, and just multiply it by itself. But this would clearly double the poles both in the S and the U channels. But nicely, the kernel has zeros that take care of canceling the double poles and leaving simple poles. The product was lagging a pole in the T channel, but nicely, the kernel provides this. So if we just didn't know about KLT to begin with, this seems almost too good to be true. I can sort of cook this up to get the right pole structure, but the fact that it even factorizes correctly on all those pole structures to compute, to, to actually give the correct factorization of the graviton amplitude is quite non-trivial. So the double, con kernel, double copy kernel takes care of eliminating double poles in the product of amplitudes, and it provides the missing poles. It has a number of other bonus properties which are not uh, discussed in this talk, but it enhances soft behaviors. And in certain cases, it also enhances soft, uh, it also enhances uh, some of the unbroken global symmetries. But what we need to keep in mind is as we try to change the multiplication rule by perhaps changing the kernel, this may well destroy these desirable properties. And that's one thing that tells you that you can't just put anything in to be the kernel. It's very important that it has these properties. There's another very important aspect of the field theory KLT formula 
which I'll call the KKPCJ relations. So let me motivate where this comes from. I gave you two different forms of the double copy. There's only one gravity amplitude, so these two things must compute the same thing. Subtracting them from each other gives me zero on one side. I can factor out the one, two, three, four factor that these two have in common. And I'm left with the amplitude, which is an example of a BCJ Baron Carrasco Johansson relation at full point. This relation happens to be true for Yang Mills amplitudes, but it's in general not true for all full point amplitudes you can think of writing down in a single color order theory. So this gives a constraint on what you're allowed to put into the KLT formula in order to get it to be independent of which color orderings you used in the sum. To get it to be completely independent of all possible choices of color orderings of these n minus three factorial ones, at four point we need to impose the KK relations, which split into three trace reversal relations as one as well as one U1 decoupling relation, and then the BCJ relation that I just derived for you here. And together I will call these the KK BCJ relations. So those are five relations that reduces the six independent color orderings of a cyclic trace down to just a single one. And that single one is exactly the one that is n minus three factorial for n equals four. More generally at four point, uh, at the end point, these KKBCJ relations combine to reduce via KK from n minus one factorial to n minus two factorial and BCJ further from n equals two factorial to n minus three factorial. To give exactly the same, no the right number that you're summing over in the KK, in, in the KLT relations. And these relations ensure that the result of the double copy is independent of which color orderings I picked in the formula. So that gives me different equivalent versions of doing the KLT double copy. We can also reverse this and say, given these relations, that gives us a way of exploring the landscape of field theories and understanding which field theories are allowed input for the double copy. So you can think of this as a selection criterion. And in order to be double copyable, to be input on the left and the right sector in the KLT formula, the theory is three amplitudes must obey the KKBCJ relations. So which theories can be input and which theories can be output of these relations? Well, let's think about the input. I mentioned Yang-Mills theory satisfy these relations already. It's supersymmetrizations, pure string of Yang-Mills theory satisfy this as well. The nonlinear sigma model known as chiral perturbation theory satisfy these constraints too. And there's a model called the biadjoint scalar model, which we'll talk about later, which also solves these equations. What about in the context of effective field theories? If I think about Yang-Mills with higher derivative operators, it was shown by Dixon and Brodel quite a while ago that F cube satisfies the, double, the KKPCJ relations in field theory, but no contractions of F to the four do. Here I'm listing operators that do and do not, and I'm just listing the contributions to the MHV counting. And you can see, for example, at F to the four, there's only one contribution, it's not allowed by KKBCJ. At the next order, D squared F to the four, there are two independent operators that can contribute to the MHV four point amplitude. One is allowed by KKBCJ, the other one is not. And at higher orders, there's similar patterns. Here's the pattern that you get if you consider higher derivative corrections to chi pt. So clearly there's some selection principle on the space of field theories in EFT context imposed by the KKBCJ relations. But is this the most general story? Let's think about what it is that we're actually doing. So we're taking Yang-Mills theory plus higher derivatives for the left and the right sector inputs. And then we hope to get gravity plus higher derivatives out on the other side. But when we do this with high derivative corrections with generic Wilson coefficients, it may seem very reasonable that we also attempt to do higher derivative corrections to the kernel. And so that is exactly one of the motivations for this study is why shouldn't we also do that to get the most general possible output on the left-hand side? In fact, string theory does exactly that. It corrects in the alpha prime expansion, the kernel. And so let's just review how that works. So of course, KLT originally came from string theory in which is stated that the closed string tree amplitude is related to products, sums of a product of the open string in the exact same form that we just discussed, but where the kernel here is the KLT kernel. This kernel can, it takes a form here in, in, in one particular component of it is minus sine times pi times alpha prime s. And 
This function here, if you expand it in the small alpha prime limit, the low energy limit, you reproduce up to some overall factors, exactly the minus S I mentioned before uh, is the KLC field theory KLC limit. And then it gives higher power powers in the Mandelstam variables as corrections to this. Now these corrections are very specific. In fact, the KLT kernel at string level is cleanly, is very deeply linked between the structure of the open string amplitudes and the closed string amplitudes in order to produce exactly the correct pole structure and other properties of the closed string amplitudes. And that translates into the statement that this low energy expansion is very specific. For example, if we, I had thought about just blindly, mod blindly modifying this kernel at higher orders, I could have thought about putting in an S squared or a T squared, but that doesn't appear. There's in fact no T or U dependence whatsoever in this kernel, in this, in this particular component. And there are also only odd powers of S, no even powers. Why is it like this? Well, it is like this because the kernel here is clearly correlated with the input of the open string amplitudes. But the open string amplitudes, of course, have very particular operators appearing in the alpha prime expansion. And if I'm thinking about doing something more general with higher derivative operators put in with generic Wilson coefficients, it's not entirely clear that what I should use is the field theory kernel or the string kernel. I should use a more general form. And so this gets us to the point, what are the rules actually for generalizing the KLT kernel? And that's what this framework that we're discussing is about. So let's remind ourselves that, that modifying that kernel could be a bit disastrous because we needed all these pole structures to work out correctly. We needed to eliminate possible double poles from the product of the amplitudes. We need to provide missing poles that were not already there in the product. And then another point is that we certainly need this kernel to be such that it doesn't start introducing spurious poles because then the left-hand side of this equation would be nonsense. We want the left-hand side to be three amplitudes in some local theory. And therefore they can't have um, weird poles in places where three amplitudes should not have it. So the proposal here is a new framework for systematically analyzing the generalizations of the double copy kernel. And we call that the KLT bootstrap. This proposal is based on the KLT algebra, which I'll now introduce. And I'll be specific about what I mean by this algebra. So I mentioned that there are a number of different field theories that satisfy the KKBCJ relations. And when I think about the KLT kernel as defining a multiplication rule, I can also write down a multiplication uh, table for the double copy. So Yang Mills, time Yang Mills, gives me gravity. It's a symmetric kernel. So everything is symmetric across the diagonal here. N equals four Yang Mills times N equals four Yang Mills gives me N equals eight supergravity. If I double copy chi PT with itself, I get the special Galilean. If I double copy it with Yang Mills, I get von Infeld theory. I can get super symmetric, super direct von Infeld, and so on. The last column and last row of this table is the bi adjoint scalar model, a cubic bi adjoint scalar. It is a model whose Lagrangian is extremely simple. Uh, the field content is a scalar that transforms in the adjoint of two different non abelian uh, color groups or flavor groups, if you like. So a UN and a U1 prime set. It has a cubic interaction, which is simply the adjoint indices contracted via the antisymmetric structure constants of the UN and the UN prime. And that's it. There's nothing else. That's the cubic bi adjoint scalar theory. And that's what I'll refer to in this talk as BAS. When you look at this multiplication table, you spot something very nice which is that when you double copy BAS with anything else, you get that anything else back. So looking at that column and row, we see that this map, this double copy map has an identity element. And that identity element is the bi adjoint scalar model. If we wrote the same thing out for string theory, string theory also has an identity element. And that identity element turns out in the alpha prime expansion to be exactly the bi adjoint scalar model plus very specific higher derivative operators. And this was this is based on an observation uh, and results by Sebastian Mazera from a little while back that I'll mention specifically uh, shortly. So to summarize, with the identity element, I'm thinking much about field theory here, I have a KLT algebra that says that by adjoint scalar theory is equal to by adjoint scalar theory multiplied by by adjoint scalar theory. And likewise, by adjoint scalar theory multiplied from the left or right with anything else gives that anything else back. And by anything else, I mean, of course, things 
subject to the KKBCJ relations. Okay, so this is the KLT algebra that we are now going to study. Now, when I look at this equation here, one equals one times one, it sort of makes sense that if I start changing what my multiplication rule is, I may also have to change what my identity element is and vice versa. There's a clean and unique link between the kernel and the identity model. And I'll show you that explicitly later. So this becomes actually a bootstrap equation because this involves no single copy models. It just relies on whatever is the identity model to end the product rule. And these are linked together. So when I start thinking about generalizing the double copy, this is the equation that ends up bootstrapping it. And I'll show you how that works at full point. What about these two other relations that I, as of course the defining relations for what an identity element of a given multiplication rule is? Well, it turns out, and I'll let's show it here, but I'll refer you to a paper, to a paper, that these relations are exactly equivalent to the KKBCJ relations when the multiplication rule is the usual multiplication rule for field theory KLT. When the multiplication rule is defined by the string KLT relation, these identities here are exactly the string monotony relations. And when I generalize my multiplication rule using the KLT bootstrap, these relations become the generalized KKBCJ relations that ensure that the double copy is independent of the basis choice. So this is basically summarizing what the approach is. I preserve this algebra as I changed my KLT multiplication rule by changing what the identity element is. I bootstrap it down, and this then becomes the rules for defining which theories can be put in as a left and right input in the double copy relation. So in the remainder of the talk, I, in, in the remainder of the talk, I'll show you now how the relations between the biadjoint tree amplitudes, the identity model amplitudes, and the field theory KLT, KLT relation work out, and how we end up getting a bootstrap out of this. I'll show you how we can generalize the KLT kernel by generalizing the biadjoint scalar model, give you examples at four point, talk about higher point, and then briefly give some summary and outlook. First, who ordered this by adjoint model? Why does it show up? It's a weird model. It has a potential that unbounded for below. What is the deal with this thing? How does it show up? Let me briefly mention why or how. In, in the double copy formula, a formulation by uh, B, C, and J, we write a tree level amplitude in terms of color factors and numerator factors divided by propagators summed over the trivalent diagrams in the model. The color kinematic duality proposal is that whenever the color factors satisfy the Jacobi identities, the associated numerator factors have to do the same. When they have this property, you can replace the color factors by numerator factors, either of the same model or by a different model. And the result is a sensible double copy amplitude. For example, yang mills time chain mills would give us gravity plus in the usual way. But I could also have done something else. I could sort of taken this numerator factor and just replace it by another color factors. Then I'll get something that whole kinematic dependence in which is just the scalar propagators. There's a double color ordered structure, and these amplitudes are exactly the amplitudes of the biadjoint scalar model. So from this, we see that this model, however weird it is, perhaps with unbounded from below potential and so on, just has a natural role to play in the double copy. So what does it mean when we say that biadjoint is equal to the double copy of itself? Well, here I have the usual KLT formula, and you see that the second color ordering of the doubly colored by adjoint amplitudes, the colored with respect to color ordering, and we think about these, these are single trace amplitudes. So the second color ordering takes actively, plays an active role in the KLT double copy with the sum over alpha. And the first index of the second one plays an active role, but there are two indices left over, gamma, and delta are two color orderings that are inherited in the double copy. And so that gives you again a doubly color ordered amplitude. And the statement is that when you do this multiplication rule where the kernel is your usual field theory kernel, then this exactly is a true relation no matter which color orderings gamma and delta I pick and no matter which ones I pick for the N minus three factorial color orderings alpha and beta. Obviously this is matrix multiplication. So let's write this in matrix form in terms of n minus three factorial times n minus three factorial submatrices. So now we have a very compact form of what it means to have one equals one times one. If I take this relation here, 
And I multiply from the left as well as from the right with the inverse of mn. Then I arrive at a very simple result, which says that the KLT kernel is nothing but the inverse of an n minus three factorial by n minus three factorial submatrix of bi adjoint scalar amplitudes. And this was an observation that was first made by Cortazzo and collaborators in the context of the CHY formalism. So this is what I meant that there's a clean and unique link between the bi adjoint scalar, the identity element of the multiplication rule, and the kernel. Of course, you might say, well, how do I know that these matrices are even invertible? It turns out that they are. It turns out that if you look at the full matrix of all possible color orderings, the n minus one factorial possible color orderings of the bi adjoint amplitudes, that matrix has rank n minus three factorial, and all these submatrices are invertible. So here's the punchline. The KLT kernel is really inverse of the submatrix of bi adjoint scalar amplitudes. Let's write it in the four point case where these are just n minus three factorial is just one. The three amplitudes that are color ordered with respect to both color factors uh, are such that in the one, two, three, four, if I choose these color orderings to be the same, I have both the S and the U channel contributions. But if I flip the ordering of the second argument, the ordering is only compatible with the S channel. So that's the only one I pick up. And there's a minus sign because of the anti-symmetric structure constants. The inverse, is just the inverse of these elements, and they take the form of the KLT kernels that I showed you very early on in the talk. Now there's a factor of one over G squared, which is really just a dimensional dependence that shows up and which we take along uh, and use in our map. Okay, what about the string KLT kernel? Well, as shown by Sebastian Isera, the string KLT kernel is the inverse Likewise, of an n minus three factorial times n minus three factorial submatrix of bi adjoint scalar amplitudes plus very specific higher derivative operators when you expand an alpha prime. Actually, Sebastian found a form of this which was not expanded in alpha prime, but the exact sum solution of this, in which you replace the typical one over scalar propagators with one over either sine or tangents of these same type of things multiplied by pi alpha primes. So we can see that when we expand this in small alpha prime, we get the leading by adjoint scalar contribution for this particular element of the kernel, plus higher derivative corrections of a very specific form because they came from the strings kernel, namely one linear in S, one quadratic in, uh, oh, sorry, cubic in S, but nothing quadratic in S, no leading constant term here, nothing of that sort, and certainly no SOT dependence of this particular component. So a very special form. Now this gives us, of course, a way to try to generalize the kernel, namely by asking if this specific high derivative terms are the only ones allowed, or if we wrote a more general ansatz for bi adjoint scalar theory plus higher derivative terms, what is then allowed? So at this point, I haven't really said what allowed means because all I said was that one equals one times one links the identity model to the kernel. But are there any constraints then on the high derivative operators? The answer to this is, is that, that yes, there is. And so let me just outline how this works at four point. So we have the relation between what one equals one times one means. And we know that this meant that the kernel was the inverse of one the immense. So that might appear to see then, it might appear that this makes this relation uh, trivial, but it does not. Because when I write one equals one times one, I make a particular choice in the KLC formula of which n minus three factorial color orders I pick to participate. And if I pick ones to participate, that means that this MN matrix is not really the same as the inverse MN matrix there, then the product is not just one for the identity. So in fact, let me show you how this is non-trivial at four point. So I pick as my gamma and delta color orderings, one, two, three, four. And as my alpha and beta color orderings, which are the ones that appear in the sum, one, two, four, three. The inverse here is the kernel part. This is the left factor. This is the right factor. Clearly, if I didn't know anything about these matrix elements, then I would say that these, these relations are non-trivial. And in fact, I can rearrange them into a form that looks exactly like the vanishing of a two by two minor of the six by six matrix of all possible double color ordered amplitudes. 
And since this relation has to be true, no matter which choice of color orderings I pick, what this identity one times one, one times one equals one really says is that at four point, the six by six matrix has to have rank one. The manage that has all the two by two minus have to vanish. Okay. So that is what the bootstrap equation means. It means that not only is the kernel linked to the biadjoint scalar amplitudes plus perhaps corrections or linked to the matrix elements of the identity uh, uh, model, but it also puts constraints on what the rank of that full matrix of matrix elements has to be. And that is what the bootstrap is. So let's see how it works at full point. I have the six different color orderings. I keep one fixed because of the cyclic relations and I have six other orderings. So I have the six by six matrix and here are the row of first matrix elements. I could parameterize them with six different functions, but it turns out they're not all independent due to cyclic symmetry and momentum relabeling. I only have one, two and F6 as my independent function. And when I put those into the six by six matrix, I find a system that generically has rank six. But now I have to impose my four point bootstrap equations that says this matrix has to really just have rank one. So all the two by two minus have to vanish and I can solve the system exactly in terms of just one function that I picked to be F2. In particular, you see if one is fixed in terms of F2 by some momentum relabelings and F6 must equal F1, which is basically a trace reversal symmetry. Moreover, the F2 can't be chosen in any possible way. It has to satisfy the self-consistency relation. It's very easy to see that the biadjoint scalar amplitudes as well as the string amplitudes found by Nisera solve this system. And the question then is what else solves this? So we write a general ansatz for our function F2 subjected to the bootstrap equation, the self-consistency relation. When we put it in to give us F1, we also have to ensure F1 doesn't have any spurious poles. That places a few extra constraints. And the output then is that F2 can be the biadjoint amplitude plus corrections that depend on T and S at linear order, a certain combination of S and T at the quadratic order, and then there are a whole slew of cubic terms as well as higher order terms. And you can solve this in principle to as high order as you like. Comparing with the strings result, we find that if you set A11 to be minus one six and A10 to be zero, all the A3 something components to be zero except A33, which must be minus seven over 360. And you then identify the UV scale lambda in terms of alpha prime and pi's, you exactly match the tree result. So what we see here is that what solves the bootstrap in this way of doing in, in this ENT context is way more general than the strings kernel. Where does this come from at the level of Lagrangian? So here I'm translating uh, A10 and A11 to sort of more intuitive set of objects that are the coefficients that I call A left and A right. The Lagrangian for these corrections then look like the usual biadjoint scalar model. Plus, and see, you see the leading corrections that appear are of order d squared five to the four. There's one term here, the first one, which only involve anti-symmetric structure constants, whereas the two other ones involve the symmetric tensor structures of the color groups. There are three different operators, but only two independent coefficients. Let's make some observations about this. First of all, at cubic order, I could have imagined adding an operator that instead of the anti-symmetric structure constants had the fully symmetric ones. But that doesn't solve the rank one bootstrap equations. I'll comment on what it does later. There's also no fight with the four term, also because that doesn't solve the rank one bootstrap equations. And then if I look at these presence of the symmetric DABCs, they will necessarily modify the U1 decoupling identities that are part of the KK relations. And they provide a generalization of the strings monotony relations. One thing we notice is that because these three coefficients are linked to each other, there's no way at this order in corrections that I can preserve the U1 decoupling identity because the only operator that does so is the one here in the second line, but that cannot be non-zero without either A left or A right being non-zero. And so that means that you have violation of the U1 decoupling relation, at least on the left or the right, even perhaps both. 
Now the strength kernel is symmetric in how it treats the left and the right input. In particular, it has a left equal to a right. So in some sense, we might be able to think about our generalization of the KLT double copy kernel as some kind of heterotic type double copy in that it treats the left and the right input sectors differently. Okay, now let's take this and apply it at four point. So let's apply it to the MHV sector of yang mills theory as higher derivative corrections. So we can make a general ansatz for what the higher derivative corrections can be and ask what passes the now generalized KKBGJ relations that arise from insisting that our new corrected identity model satisfies the right KLT algebra with the input. What we find is of course that the general yang mills passes. Then we find that there's the pole term from an input of two F cube vertices, that's natural. We expected that even in the usual case. But now we find that F to the four is actually allowed but it has to have a coefficient that is linked to the A left that appeared in the kernel, but you can have it. And then there's a D squared F to the four that's allowed. It also was in the usual BCJ case, and you can continue this easily to as high order as you like. Similarly, there's an expression for the right sector. So to summarize what you get going to higher and higher orders is that we saw, saw now that F to the four is allowed, at the next order, one is allowed, one is still not allowed. So you still see there's still a selection principle involved. And then at higher order, we start now having more terms allowed too. But in any case, there's still some selection. Doing the same for chi PT plus higher derivative corrections, we're starting to see certain things being allowed, but there's still other things that are not allowed. But now, and this is by the now generalized KKBCJ relations defined by our kernel. Small thing to notice, if I fix the kernel with its given a left and a rights, then the coefficients that's required of f to the four to be there and the one of the six f phi to the four to be there, sort of operators of really different operator dimensions, those turn out to be linked for a given kernel. All right, so let's double copy this. So double copy of yang mills plus higher derivatives with itself, what do you get? Well, we get the usual Einstein gravity. That's this term here with its S, T, and U channels that we talked about. Notice, by the way, that I keep the left and right couplings of the yang mills theory distinct. That allows me to really track where everything is going. In particular, one thing I can track easily is that the pole term that now sits here in S, it has contributions from an internal scalar, but it's, it's actually in four dimensions, two distinct scalars, both the dilaton and the axion contributes. And the axion only contributes when the left and the right in, uh, couplings are distinct. Now we have a long coefficient here. This is the big coefficient that multiplies a local R to the four contribution. The usual terms that shows up in the usual formula, in the usual uh, KLT, is that this local R to the four operator is generated as a double copy of the leading order Yang Mills plus what comes, as you can tell here, going back a few steps from the d squared f to the four operator. It could not have come from f to the four squared because that's not a, a proper term. It's not allowed in the usual version. But now we see that there's a shift of the coefficient that vanishes in string theory, but it's coming from the kernel, which is the quadratic Mandelstam variable co co corrections in the kernel. And that provides a shift now that you can generate another contribution to R to the four, even in the absence of say the D squared F to the four times. What we find even going to quite high order at tiered four point is that we generate the same operators as in the usual BCJ case, but with shifts of the coefficients. Perhaps this is different at higher multiplicity um, or perhaps there's something more general at work there. I'll make some comment later. Finally, there's an important part about going to higher point. Four point is kinematically very constrained. So it's always important to go and check higher point. For example, what would happen if I now go to five point? At five point, the, the, the by adjoint scalar amplitude plus higher derivative depends on the four point input because there's factorization into three particle and four particle contributions. And those four particle contributions depend on the four point coefficients for higher derivative corrections, the AIGs. If we impose these bootstrap equations at five point and were to find that the four point coefficients were constrained, we'd be in trouble 
Because what if we go to even higher point, maybe there are more bootstrap constraints for, from higher point down to lower point. We'll never know where to stop unless we rule out everything, of course, which, which we don't. So we analyze five point, and here's a brief outline of how it works. There are n minus one factorial, meaning 24 distinct orderings. If you use cyclic symmetry and momentum relabelings, the 24 by 24 distinct matrix elements that appear uh, can be parameterized by simply eight functions, which you call G1 through G8. Now we have to impose the proper rank condition n minus three factorial, 24 by 24 matrix has to have to vanish, but we can solve that system. And what we find is a consistent solution for the bootstrap five point by adjoint scalar plus higher derivative amplitudes. And they place no constraints whatsoever on the four point coefficient. They play no constraints on the AIJs. And that's extremely important for consistency. In fact, we find five, that five minutes. Great. Up to quadratic order and model stamps, the amplitudes are completely fixed by the four-point input, and it's only starting at higher order that the local terms at five-point can even have their own independent coefficients. And we then went on to test this for the particular case of imposing the more generalized five-point KKPCJ relations for the self-dual amplitude in angles plus higher derivatives, and double copied it, and everything is sensible in that case. So let me just summarize what we got and make some comments about uh, generalizations and, and what this really is about. So we have investigated and perhaps clarified the algebraic structure of the KLT multiplication rule. And we have shown that the KLT algebra gives a systematic way to generalize the double copy in KLT form. And this is what we call the double copy or a KLT bootstrap. In what I've shown you here at four points specifically is that we can solve the biadjoint scalar model plus high derivative terms and we do this by imposing what we call minimal rank n minus three factorial and four point and five point. So why do we impose this particular choice of rank? Well, that's because if you add higher derivative corrections to the model, you want the rank to be preserved because after all, the kernel relies on an inverse of this rank. But if the rank changed to become higher, which it does for generic high derivative corrections, you would be in trouble that the UV physics wouldn't decouple from the low energy point of view when you remove the high derivative corrections. So this is this is sort of the required choice for the context of bi adjoint scalar plus higher derivative corrections. And then we tested this in multiple examples at four point and five point for Yang Mills and Kai PT. Again, the whole pro proposal relies on first solving a KLT bootstrap equation from the KLT algebra. And then when you double copy stuff, you can explore what is double copyable by imposing these generalized KKPCJ relations. Some comments about outlook. So to the order we changed, we have checked so far, and then there's a low multiplicity, just four and five point. The generalized double copy produces the same higher derivative operators on the left-hand side, so in the double copied amplitude. But the Wilson coefficients get shifted by the higher derivative corrections in the kernel. Perhaps again, this is just because it's small multiplicity and things are sort of kinematically very constrained, but perhaps something is more fundamental about this. So we're currently with uh, a new student, Alan Chen, studying some similarity transformation that uh, attempts to map you from the usual KLT field theory formula into the more general form. And we're finding some interesting algebraic structure there that hopefully um, we can put together soon in a paper. I also want to mention that the method that we have here, the framework is more than just by adjoint scalar free with high derivative terms. It's really a framework for exploring more general forms of the double copy. For example, does there exist double copies that do not involve the cubic by adjoint scalar interaction at all? Can I take G, the coupling of that to zero? Also, what about this minimal coupling condition? If I throw away the by adjoint scalar part, then are there other solutions? And here I want to refer to Sudi's talk that's coming up next uh, on the massive double copy because that paper she wrote with Callum Jones and uh, Laura Johnson on generalizing the double copy to include massive particles uh, played a lot of uh, played a big role for motivating how we saw this work and how we set it up to begin with. And there, the minimal rank condition also plays a fundamental role. And then in this our work, we also initiated a study on non-minimal rank examples. And so there's more to do there, but let me mention a few things. So what if we throw away the bi-adjoint scalar model and say we just replace it at cubic order 
with the symmetric structure with the symmetric index uh, index structures instead of the fully anti-symmetric ones. So at three point, it's rank one, just as the usual thing. But at four point, it's no longer minimal rank one, but rank three. No problem. The kernel makes sense as a three by three matrix now. It's all right. But then when you go to five point, you find out that the system has rank 11 now instead of minimal rank two. And then you see that the inverse you get from the amplitude to the, to the 11 by 11 inverses that define in this context, the generalized KLT kernel has spurious poles. Now it's possible that in certain cases, such as the trivial case where you just have a phi cubed uh, theory, that those spurious poles cancel in the sum of this 11 by 11 matrix multiplied in by a left and a right amplitude. But it certainly doesn't in all cases as we showed. So that means this theory has problems or at least require additional cancellations. What about if we drop all cubic interactions and just start with a leading order phi to the four? At rank four, it's also, at, at four point is still rank one, there are no problems. At six point, it's rank 10, it's okay. But when you go to eight point, you find a system that is a little complicated to work with as it has a rank 273 and it has spurious poles in the inverse. It may be okay in some cases, but not in, in necessarily in all, and, and we don't know exactly what is happening here. So these are two no-go results, but we might well ask if there are other exact solutions of the KLC bootstrap equations, or if there are things that don't involve PCJ. So this is so, so the, the BAS, and so these are things that uh, we can study more in the future. I also want to mention that there's some recent work on higher derivative terms in the color factors in the BCJ formulation of the double copy by Carrasco, Rubina, Tikioglu, and, and Yin. And two papers uh, very recently on that. Now, if you take that BCJ form with the higher derivative corrections in the color factors, you can map this, at least in the examples that we have checked, into biactor and scalar plus higher derivative terms. And it turns out that their terms also give something that has minimal rank. We have translated this system into ours in a couple of different cases, but there are certain relationships that need to be studied more. Um, I have an example where motivated by what they have is that they have something that are exact solution with high derivatives. So by adjoint scalar, throw away a left, stay with a right, and you have an exact minimal rank system, but with four point and five point. It treats left and right differently. Here's the kernel. Here is left order amplitude. It's just the usual Yang Mills. But the right sector allows Yang Mills plus an F to the four term, whose coefficient is determined by AR. Funny enough, when you double copy these two things with each other, the higher derivative contribution exactly cancel. So this gives an example where you get pure gravity with no higher derivative terms from the double copy of Yang Mills plus Yang Mills times Yang Mills plus F to the four. So it's just one example of how the link between high derivative terms and the kernel are very special. Uh, and so these kind of things definitely differ, deserve some more uh, studies. Finally, I want to mention that when we look at the double copy, I said that we generate the same set of operators, but with shifted Wilson coefficients. And so it's very interesting in these contexts to study if positivity constraints such as EFT heat run or other UV completability constraints uh, are allowing us to try to understand from a bottom-up approach what makes the strings kernel so special. So leaving you with this set of open questions, I want to thank my collaborators, Callum, Shruti, Aiden, and Juan Heng, and thank you for listening to this. I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you. So are there any questions? Uh, so let's and Hey, thanks for a nice talk, uh, Henrietta. Um, question about a Kleist coif. It looks to me like uh, Kleist, the Kleist coif relations are generically broken for this generalized KLT, but I guess they are for string theory too. The, the question is, is there a subspace of things you can do that, that preserve Kleist coif? Yeah, so, so you can certainly study that. So for example, if, if I go back, um, what we're finding say at four point is that the trace reversal part of KK are still preserved. It's only the U1 decoupling relation that's modified. And we saw that at the order D squared phi to the four in the effective Lagrangian for B BAS, that that would necessarily break U1 decoupling. But the next coefficient that I called A20, 
if I keep that one, but I drop my A left and A right, then I can preserve the U1 decoupling identity. Okay, so that one just involves uh, F structure constants and not Ds. Uh, yes, that one just involves F structure constants, but every time you have these more generalized D, A, B, C, so yeah, D, A, B, C, then you lose and so on, you break U1. Yeah. And so you can simply go through and you can say, I want a double copy that preserves you one decoupling. What are the constraints? And if you, you could also, for example, say, what if I don't want to modify the usual BCJ relations? I think if you always keep the BCJ relations, you imply the U1 decoupling. The BCJ relations are in field theory a little bit stronger than U1, but, but it doesn't go the other way around. Thank you. So I think the next one was by Oli. Yeah, thanks a lot for the beautiful talk, Henrietta. Thank you. Um, you took the string theory KLT as a starting example for putting higher derivatives into the kernel. Now, for this string theory kernel where we just have powers of pi, we know that it shows up in the open string amplitudes, all these zeta 2, zeta 4, zeta even, but they consistently drop out from the closed string amplitudes. So all the pi square are, if you wish, fake, if you're focusing on gravity. Now, you showed a gravitational example where I think you did get surviving signatures of the kernel of higher derivatives, right? Right, that's right. Okay. So what is your general statistics? Are there some higher derivative corrections to the kernel that only drop out in gravity? And if so, how many of them, which subset? So we, we have a table in the paper where you can sort of see accounting at the lowest order of independent coefficients, so to speak, of, of operators. So, so it's always hard to talk about operators because they have linear relations among them and you just have some parametrization. But, but there we try to give an independent count in terms of free parameters of the coefficients. Um, as you're right, I mean, in, in this case here, the string theory coefficient vanishes. So, so I, I want to, I, I, I'd like to make, try to make two comment, comments about this. So one of these things that Rich reminds us of is of course what happens in, in, your Z, in the Z theory type of constructions, where basically you are removing the higher derivative corrections from the kernel and from one side of the double copy into the entirely into the other side, which is somehow bizarre when I first saw it. So it reminds me a lot of that. I think we have seen in some examples that we can't in generic cases just remove everything into one side, but we can possibly remove it, move it put from the kernel high derivative corrections into the other side. So at the level of expanding a higher derivative order, so the equivalent of the upper prime expansion, mm -hmm. it seems that it's always possible to shift your Wilson coefficients so that in, in the single color ordered amplitudes, so as to generate the same answer for the double copied amplitude. However, the tricky point is that when you try to do this, if you wanted to try to do this in a not resummed way, you'd have to be very careful about locality issues. And so you could say that it looks as if in the strings kernel, all these alpha prime corrections that it has are sort of fake. And in a sense, I think that that seems to be right when you do the alpha prime expansion, but at finite alpha prime, the kernel has some very particular properties in, that, in its poles and its zeros as, as do the open string amplitudes that exactly match up some of the spurious poles that the kernel will give with the zeros of the open string amplitude. So these are clearly very, very cleanly tuned to each other in, in a way that just, that's the way it has to be. And so in the alpha prime expansion, you think you can move these things around. Um, and then the second thing I just wanted to mention was that when I look at my, when, when we look at our four point bootstrap equations, this one that for the F2 function, one function that solves this and gives sensible results is the C theory amplitude. So we don't know what that means and what you can double copy with the C theory amplitude, but it actually solves the equations. Yeah, I think this is a really helpful answer. So thanks a lot for pointing to this um, impact of string theory KLT for the poles and zeros. Yeah, it'll, it'll be really fun to discuss more about this. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. There was also a question by Henrik. Yeah, uh, hi Henriette. Nice, hey. nice talk. It was a, it was a really nice follow it. Um, I guess I had two comments. Um, I guess. I want to just advertise one thing uh, because you you talk about def deforming KLT. So I guess I guess one one obvious deformation is to do the sum differently, as right, um, and uh, so that's something you can do when you have matter, for example. So when you have fundamental 
matter. Uh, you don't need the full n minus uh, three factorial sum, right? Um, so that that's another way you can also do it. But I, I guess it wouldn't be relevant in your context if you're interested in external uh, vectors, I guess, yeah. Um, and then, uh, well, I, I don't know, maybe a question is, have you, have you thought about- So we looked a bit at your papers yeah. about this also. Um, so, so one of the things we were curious about is that sometimes in, in our constructions, as I said, when we modified the rank away from minimal rank, we right. got things that at four point look totally sensible. We got things that meant you could double copy F to the four with F to the four to get R to the four. Right. No right. problem seemed to occur. But then when you got to high enough point, something went wrong in terms of spurious poles. And, and that reminded that there's something in your papers where also things go wrong at eight points um, in these type of constructions. So, so I think the point of view is different. If you just want some method of generating some particular operator by the simplest possible means, you can just use these things. But if right, you're interested right. in the fundamental structures of how the double copy really works and what the fundamental principles are, one seems to have to go to these higher point constraints and figure it out. And so I think the idea of, of trying to see what happens with fundamental matter as, as, as in your work is, is really interesting. And we, we haven't thought about those generalizations yet, but clearly that's something that, that one can do. I mean, I, I agree. Once you're talking about uh, gluons, external gluons, uh, then I think the the rules are kind of limited in terms of what you can do. And I guess what you found here is you, some deformation of the rules. I guess yeah, but you cannot you cannot do a subset of the of the permutation sum and so on. Yeah, that's that's probably well, true. Well, yeah. I mean, the jury is still a little bit out on that. I think in, in the examples that we saw and that I that I indicated here, we find some no go results hmm. or we put it in a different way, because these higher rank systems gives a KLT sum that is, is much bigger, you'd have to have some additional cancellations happening. So we, I played a little bit around with it and you can make it work, but I think the problem is often when you go to then higher point, getting it to work at four point sort of easy, mm -hmm. there's not that right. many things that can go wrong, but at higher points, there are many more things that can go wrong. So, right. so yeah, I think that those constraints play well. Okay, I guess the second comment I had was, so you wanted, you asked the question, what happens if you get rid of the cubic coupling in the Bayeux theory, right? Then I guess that's related to um, getting rid of the minimal coupling in, in the gauge theory, like the covariant derivative coupling and, and so on, right? So is, is that yeah. something you thought about or? Yeah, um, it, it is, but if I am, I'm interested in chi PT, I don't have any cubic interactions anyway. I don't have any odd point amplitudes anyway. Okay. So in that context, uh, uh, there was a motivation for doing that. Um, and, and I mean, just, just to add to that motivation, there's this, this funny puzzle that chi PT times chi PT gives the special Galilean. The special Galilean has a supersymmetrization but mm -hmm. chi PT does not. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, there's a mismatch in the double copy. I could also try to ask if I can get chi PT as a higher derivative correction to DBI, but DBI is the double copy of chi PT with supersymmetric yang mills theory. But that double copy, even with the generalization that we put in, does not generalize any Galileans as subleading mm -hmm. terms. They go to higher order. So there's sort of a mismatch in the effective field readings we know with, in this class of things with special soft limits that don't match up with what we know about the double copy. And that was actually one of the motivations originally for trying to modify what you can do in the double copy. And one of these no-go results we found at higher points uh, did work at four points to generate the things we wanted. But, but then it ran into trouble at six and eight. Oh, sorry, at eight points. All right, thank you. Cool. I see this was a question by Paolo. Yes. Um, hi, Henrietta. Thanks a lot for the great talk. And I, I have a very naive question, which is you found this very large web of theories that can be double copied in the KLT sense. So is it true that in all of these cases, this double copy is equivalent to squaring numerators in like a BCJ like uh, approach? So, so we don't exactly know um, that. So that comes down to this question here, relating it, how it works in, in JJ and collaborators formalism. Um, so we can match the generalized kernel at four point to some of their setups. Um, but 
it would be nice to understand the map a little bit more directly. So, so the other way of asking is, is this generalized KLT formalism, what does it look like in the BGJ form? And I think JJ's work um, on this will be, be quite useful way to, to try to map them. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, I see no further questions. So let's thank Nikesh again. And we'll have a slightly more than one and a half